Mic check, test one, two. Testing, 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 mic check. Test, 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 mic check. Test, test, one, two, mic check. The committee will come to order. Good afternoon and welcome to today's hearing entitled Public Access to Federally Funded Research. Uh, without objection, the chair and ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. And without objection, Members and witnesses may have five legislative days to submit a written statement or extraneous materials for the record. The purpose of today's hearing is to examine the current state of public access to federally funded research and to discuss the potential implications of increased access. Every year, the federal government using taxpayer dollars funds tens of billions of dollars in basic and applied research. Most of the funding is concentrated within 11 federal departments and our agencies. So while this is not a legislative hearing attached to any particular bill, there has been much interest, deservedly so, surrounding this topic on both sides of the issue. Uh, how much access should the public have to federally funded research? How would increased access affect grantees, researchers, and scholars? To that end, I determined that the subcommittee should allow an atmosphere for dialogue and discussion of public access to federally funded research. Uh, it is relevant, current, and within the purview of this subcommittee. So today we will hear testimony from stakeholders, 
in the areas of publishing, science research, education, and patient advocacy. Uh, this hearing will also examine the operational processes utilized by the National Institutes of Health in its open access program, uh, including but not limited to the submission process. Uh, data usage, embargo time period, and compliance information. Uh, we will examine how the National Institutes of, of Health uh, has, has been affected by the congressional mandate to ensure that the public has access to the published results of NIH-funded research uh, no later than 12 months after publication. Uh, what have been the results and ramifications, positive and negative, of that policy to the stakeholders? Uh, I thank all of our witnesses for appearing today and look forward to their testimonies. I now recognize uh, the distinguished uh, ranking minority member, Mr. Chaffetz of Utah, Mr. Chaffetz. Thank you, and thanks to the various witnesses that are that are here today. I appreciate your flexibility and understanding with the, all the votes and other hearings and things that are going on here prior to the to the recess. Uh, I appreciate your patience, um, and I appreciate uh, holding this hearing. Looking forward to hearing uh, the exchange from our witnesses. The extraordinary expansion of access to digital information over the past decade has caused heated debate to arise over the issue of public access to federally funded research results. The federal government funds billions of dollars in research every year, much of it in the form of grants to researchers. Typically, researchers write one or more manuscripts detailing the findings of the research in hopes of having them published as articles in scientific journals. Journal publishers subject these sub submitted manuscripts to vigorous peer-reviewed process to ensure that the scientific results and conclusions are valid prior to selection for publication. In exchange for the cost associated with peer review, editing, the publication of the manuscript, the research typically the researcher typically assigns his or her copyright to the journal publisher. Historically, Congress has directed that federally funded researchers retain expansive intellectual property rights to encourage the advancement and distribution of scientific knowledge as widely as possible. The system has proven highly successful in allowing researchers from universities in the United States and across the world access to new and constantly evolving scientific information from which they can pr pursue new discoveries and innovations. There are now more than 25,000 peer-reviewed journals worldwide produced by more than 2,000 publishers, ranging from the well-known, such as Nature or the New England Journal of Medicine, to one of my own personal favorites, and I know something that all good Americans subscribe to, the Journal on Matrix Analysis and Applications, which publishes articles of interest to the numerical linear algebra community. You subscribe, don't you, Mr. Yeah, Chairman? I'm really looking forward to reading that. Yes, I'll share my copy with you. Uh, in, the US, in the United States, the scholarly publishing enterprise provides direct employment for roughly 30,000 people. I am sympathetic to the arguments that proponents of the increased public and, and free access to federally funded research make regarding the rights of taxpayers to the results of, of that research. They paid for it and they should be able to access the fruits of that research. However, journal publishers invest a, a significant amount of money and provide a valuable service to the scientific community and the nation in peer-reviewed editing, publication, and dissemination of researched articles. According to the estimates made by the publishing community, the National Institutes of Health funded research results in approximately 85,000 journal published articles annually. By the time a final peer-reviewed manuscript is completed, the point at which NIH requires submission under their current rules, publishers estimate that they have invested in excess of $1,400 per art article or roughly $126 million annually. Concerned about the federal government mandating free access policies, such as the current one at NIH, that diminish copyright protections for private sector journal articles. Also, particularly with regard to some of the smaller nonprofit professional organizations that publish only one or two journals. I'm concerned about their ability to stay in the publishing game and their willingness to invest in the vigorous peer review process that currently makes our scientific enterprise so vibrant without strong copyright incentives. One thing I hope we all keep in mind there are many alternatives to the type of policy currently employed at the National Institutes of Health and which H.R. Uh, 5037, which has been referred to the subcommittee, would expand to other federal research funding agencies. These alternative policies would strike an appropriate balance between the taxpayer access to the results of federally funded research and the copyright incentives and, comp and protections of the publishers. 
For example, in the 2007 America Competes Act, Congress directed the National Science Foundation to develop a system whereby research reports, including a readily accessible summary of the outcomes of the NSF-sponsored research, are disseminated instead of copyrighted materials for the publishers. Again, it is a complex issue. There are a variety of directions in which we can go, and thus I think the, uh, the hearing is very appropriate. Look, for, he look forward to hearing from uh, all of the witnesses today. Appreciate your preparation, and I assure you, uh, given the schedule and whatnot, all of the information will be, re be properly reviewed. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if there are no, no more opening statements, I will now introduce our first panel. And on this panel, we will hear from Mr. Alan Adler. Mr. Adler is the Vice President of Legal and Government Affairs with the Association of American Publishers. Welcome. Uh, our next witness will be Dr. Stephen Breckler. Uh, Dr. Breckler is a graduate of the University of California at San Diego and received his master's and Ph.D. from Ohio State University. He is the author of numerous publications and articles in the area of psychology. Uh, he has served as an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins and as a program director at the National Science Foundation. He is currently the executive director at the American Psychology Association. Thank you for being here. Uh, and our third witness will be Professor Ralph Oman. Mr. Oman teaches copyright law at the George Washington University Law School. Uh, he also serves as a fellow on the faculty of the law school's Creative and Innovative Economy Center. Mr. Oman served as chief counsel for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Subcommittee on Patents, Copyrights, and Trademarks. Uh, he is a graduate of Hamilton College and Georgetown University Law Center. I want to welcome all of you for being here today. Uh, it is the policy of the subcommittee to swear in all witnesses before they testify. Uh, would you all please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, each witness will have five minutes to make opening statements, and your complete written testimony uh, will be included in the hearing record. Uh, the lighting system in front of you will indicate uh, how much time you have left. And when it turns red, we would like for you to cease and desist. Mr. Adler, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me to participate in this hearing on behalf of the Association of American Publishers, the principal trade association of the U.S. book publishing industry, whose for-profit and non-profit members publish books, journals, and other literary works in every field of human interest, both in print and digital formats. Relevant to today's hearing, AAP's membership includes some 50 for-profit companies and non-profit organizations that publish scientific, technical, and medical journals in both print and digital formats. Because I've submitted a written statement for the record, let me just briefly identify a few key points. First, as we discuss federally funded research, you'll hear references to peer-reviewed journal articles and scholarly publications, as well as characterizations of those items as the results or products of federally funded research. Such characterizations, however, are not accurate, and they are particularly misleading in the context of today's discussion. And it's critical that you keep in mind the distinction between federally funded research and the private sector journal articles that are written by the funded researchers to report and document that research. The peer-reviewed articles published in scholarly journals are not themselves funded research, nor are they deliverables required under the terms of the funding grant, as are, for example, the annual progress reports that the research grantee is typically required to submit to the funding agency. Instead, they are separate reports on the funded research written with the express intention of publication in relevant peer-reviewed journals to describe and explain the process, findings, and significance of the funded research that has been conducted by the authoring researcher. These are prepared for publication and ultimately published by peer-reviewed journals without funding from the government. 
Second, the articles that are published in peer-reviewed journals are ultimately collaborative products of the researcher and the journal publisher, which devotes a substantial amount of its editorial and other publishing resources to ensuring that the final published version of the researcher's account is accurate and that its significance is understood within the context of other research in the same field or related fields. Journal publishers invest hundreds of millions of dollars in peer review, editing, and publishing processes, including for sophisticated communications technologies and electronic resources, support personnel, and many part and full-time editors. Publishers manage all stages of the peer review process from the time a journal publisher receives a new manuscript until the final version is accepted for publication as a journal article. Each manuscript undergoes rigorous review by editors and technical experts prior to publication in a resource-intensive process that helps ensure the quality and integrity of these published accounts of scientific research. Government mandates like the NIH Public Access Policy, which requires free online access to the author's final peer-reviewed manuscript after acceptance for journal publication, expropriate, or in simpler terms, take without consideration the substantial investments that the publisher makes in providing added value to the researcher's original manuscript. And by doing so, they substantially weaken an area of our economy where the United States has a distinct comparative advantage over its competitors in global markets. Science and technology publishers based in North America account for some 45% of all peer-reviewed scientific research papers published annually worldwide. For many U.S. journal publishers, over 50% of their revenues come from subscriptions delivered outside U.S. borders. But through mandates like the NIH policy, the government intervenes to become the de facto publisher of the articles and compete directly with the journal publisher in making them available for public access and distribution. Even worse, this unwarranted competition from the government can lead to further harm to the publishers by facilitating digital piracy as we've discovered with respect to evidence showing that companies in China are reselling and distributing these journal articles as downloaded from NIH's PubMed Central database without authorization from the publisher. While some may think such piracy is not the government's fault, the simple reality is, is that in today's digitally networked world, the government cannot presume to make these copyrighted works freely available online to the U.S. taxpayer without also giving them away free to the rest of the world including competing national governments, public and private institutions, corporations, and yes, pirates, all of whom, with the exception of the pirates, would otherwise probably acquire these works from the journal publisher by subscription. If someone can get these articles for free on a government website, why would they pay to subscribe to journals? Surveys have shown that a significant number of librarians would be likely to cancel their institutional subscriptions to journals if the articles contained in them were accessible online for free. Even if the articles were not available for a year, and even if not all of the articles in the journal were available online. Thus, mandates like the NIH policy also undermine copyright protection for journal articles and diminish incentives for publishers to continue making substantial investments in managing the peer review process and otherwise improving scientific communications and providing and maintaining non-government filtered public records of federally funded research. Mr. Chairman, there are better approaches to enhancing public access to the results of federally funded research. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, Dr. Breckler, you recognize for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, I'm Dr. Steve Breckler, Executive Director for Science at the American Psychological Association. APA is the largest scientific and professional organization of psychologists um, in the United States. We're the world's largest association of psychologists with over 150,000 researchers, educators, clinicians, consultants, and students as members. APA is also the largest publisher of behavioral science research, with 56 of the premier scholarly journals in the field of psychology. The mission of APA is to advance the creation, communication, and application of psychological knowledge to benefit society and to improve people's lives. APA strongly supports the goal of public access to federally funded research. What is not clear, however, is the best way to accomplish the goal. The methods implemented to date, and the ones currently under most active consideration, do not necessarily represent the best possible methods. In fact, some carry substantial risk of harming scientific scholarship and actually impeding our ability to accomplish the ultimate goal of enhancing public access to federally funded research. 
As a citizen and as a scientist, I take enormous pride in American science. I think we all do. We are the stewards of the world's strongest and most vibrant system of scientific research and scholarship. The last thing that any of us wants to do is to harm or otherwise weaken American science. Our nation's most serious investments in science began over 60 years ago. It was recognized then that the federal government was in the best position to provide the financial resources to support science and research in this country. And it was also recognized then that the private sector and the nonprofit scholarly societies were in the best position to manage the publication and dissemination of research results in this country. The federal government did not want to get into the pub scholarly publishing business, nor did society demand it. Indeed, it has always been the opposite of maintaining a separation between the government and the final production of scholarship, of protecting academic freedom and allowing scholars in this country to do their work without government interference. The success of American science can be traced to this formula, to this division of responsibility and management of the scientific enterprise. It has served us extremely well. And now, for a variety of reasons that really have nothing to do with scientific achievement and advancement, some among us want to change the formula. Change can be a good thing, but it should be well-reasoned and thoroughly researched before wholesale implementation. A mistake could mean irreparable damage, an outcome that none of us wants. I have provided detail in our written testimony about some of the potential risk of poorly developed public access policies. Scholarly publishers add tremendous value to the communication and dissemination of science, and we invest enormous resources in the process. Yet the current public misunderstanding is that those costs are either inconsequential or that the government already bears those costs. Neither is true. Alternative models for public access exist. NSF, for example, requires its investigators to submit their final project reports and citations to published research documents resulting from their research for posting on the NSF public website. This is consistent with the fact that taxpayers are paying for the research results, not for the publications. APA suggests that the current situation offers the opportunity to conduct a natural experiment to evaluate the various public access models currently in place. This opportunity was recognized by OSTP when it noted in late 2009 that the NIH model has a variety of features that can be evaluated and there are other ways to offer the public enhanced access to peer-reviewed scholarly publications. Indeed, it is implementation of a public pol access policy NIH assumes that 12 months provides a sufficient embargo period to allow publishers enough time to recoup their investment. Yet, as the data we provided in our written testimony demonstrate, 12 months is clearly too short a time for many publishers, especially those in the social and behavioral sciences, to recover even a fraction of their investments. In APA's experience, less than 16 percent of the ultimate usage of a journal article occurs within the first 12 months of publication. We can do better. We need to bring all stakeholders to the table to develop a viable system of public access, one that makes federally funded research accessible to the public, but without sacrificing or harming the very scientific infrastructure supported by the federal government and desired by the public. This was the recommendation of the OSTP Scholarly Publishing Roundtable, and it is the basis for a provision of the Competes Bill currently working its way through Congress to establish an interagency working group on public access. APA supports these recommendations, but we emphasize the need to include the perspective of scientific societies that publish social and behavioral science research. When it comes to policies surrounding public access to federally funded research, we must be thoughtful and careful and willing to take the time and make the effort to do it right. Otherwise, we run the real risk of reducing rather than increasing public access to federally funded research and of causing long-term harm to America's science and technology infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Breckler, for your testimony. Uh, Professor Oman, you may proceed. It's a great honor to be here today. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm not necessarily a stakeholder here. Uh, I am appearing as the former Register of Copyrights of the United States, and I, as always, represent the public interest. Uh, I, I don't represent any of the parties, uh, but like an old fire horse, I hear, the <laughs> I hear the bells ring, and I'm off and running to protect the U.S. copyright system. I am I'm con I'm concerned uh, that the new public access proposals uh, that we have before us will, in fact, weaken the commercial market for scientific, technical, and medical journals. 
if the publishers of these journals eventually uh, get out of business because they can't make it pay, uh, we will lose a very valuable tool for uh, scientific advance. If sales plummet, how could the publishers continue to publish? And I suppose that is the issue that we have to answer today, whether or not that dire prediction will in fact come true. I urge Congress to uh, develop a public access policy that respects the spirit of the copyright law. The Patent and Copyright Clause of the Constitution urges Congress, quote, to promote the progress of science and the useful arts, unquote, summarizing the rest of the, the uh, provision by giving authors and publishers an exclusive right in their writings. With that powerful incentive direct from the Constitution uh, to commercialize their journals, the publishers will reach as broad an audience as possible for these important publications. The tension between authors and inventors who, from, <coughs> who benefit from government research grants on the one hand and the advocates of government ownership of the fruits of that research on the other has been with us for a long time. I worked on the Bayh-Dole legislation back in 1980 uh, for my old boss, Senator Mathias of Maryland. In that debate over patent policy uh, in 1980, Senator Russell Long of Louisiana argued that any patents developed with government research funds should be owned by the government. In his inimitable style, he thundered, we paid for it, we own it. Senator Bayh and Senator Dole reasoned that the taxpayers would get a far greater return on investment if we instead facilitated private sector ownership and commercialization of these patents, putting the inventions to work for the American people, creating jobs, and helping American competitiveness. They won that argument, and the Small Business and University Patent Procedure Act has given American innovation a big boost around the world. The same policy arguments apply here, Mr. Chairman. For all the reasons mentioned by Mr. Adler and Dr. Breckler, I do not think that the government should get deeply involved in scholarly publishing. It is a bad fit for a free enterprise economy with our tradition of free speech. With normal, normal copyright protection, the private sector publishers will run the peer, uh, review, the re peer review process. Uh, they will select the articles. They will aggressively market those, uh, those publications uh, uh, to corporations, to libraries, uh, to research institutions. That's the American way. A broad, free public access policy is an unfortunate precedent for a country like the United States, uh, whose great strength in foreign markets is intellectual property. I spent more than eight years of my life as Register of Copyrights, fighting to protect American authors and publishers from foreign pirates. And I find it a little strange today that Congress may now decide to give away some of that intellectual property free of charge. The pirates must feel vindicated. There's a huge foreign commercial market for these publications, and a free access policy would cost the United States millions of dollars that we now get from rich foreign governments and large foreign corporations. Uh, as Senator Mathias, uh, my old boss, uh, once said, talk about Uncle Sap. It's like standing on the coastline and shoveling buckets of greenbacks into the ocean. We are the only country, as far as I know, to have uh, such a give it away for nothing policy. I hope Congress will give the evolving digital marketplace a chance to come to grips with the new online technologies without undercutting the incentives that publishers have relied on for 200 years. We all have compassion for the parent of a sick child with a rare disease, wanting to have quick and easy access to articles explaining the latest state-of-the-art therapies. Let's solve that problem of patient access without doing damage to the incentives provided by copyright. Let's all sit down and reason together and figure out how to get the job done. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Professor Omar. And we will, we will now move to the uh, question period for members uh, and proceed under the five-minute rule. I, I'm, we will begin with Mr. Chaffetz for five minutes.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I appreciate it. Uh, one of the things we're looking at is H.R. 5037, um, and one of the things that would happen under that, that piece of legislation is that it would shorten the time, the embargo time, from 12 months to 6 months. Can you give me a sense of the impact that you would see by moving from 12 months to 6 months? And I'll give you a brief time, but I, I've only got 5 minutes, so I've got to go swiftly. We'll start maybe with Mr. Adler. Well, Congressman, the fact of the matter is, as we've argued all along, there is no one-size-fits-all uh, embargo period that will make sense uh, in journal publishing across the diverse economic models that exist for publishers. Uh, what might work with respect to a large commercial publisher doesn't necessarily work with a not-for-profit society publisher or a patient advocacy organization which publishes a journal not so much uh, in the same way that a large commercial publisher would looking for profits, but simply to help generate additional funds to support some of its other patient advocacy uh, activities. So the situation here is, is that if you have a, a journal that publishes on a schedule uh, that's quarterly, annually, as opposed to one that publishes once every month, uh, the idea that an embargo of six months is going to work adequately for all of them simply makes no economic sense. Uh, that's correct. And, and in the case of social and behavioral science, where um, the shelf life of new articles is actually quite long, much longer than in other fields of science, um, we've suggested on the basis of our data that 12 months is too short. Um, six months would probably be devastating. Um, it would hurt the circulation of the journal articles, and it would also create a, a perverse sort of unfair um, advantage for federally funded research. Um, we pride ourselves at APA journals in publishing a substantial number of articles that are not funded by the federal government. It's a wonderful thing. It, it encourages scholarship and it, it increases um, productivity. Um, but if you put journal articles out there for free in six months, it creates a disincentive for people to purchase the journals and it um, drives down the ability for non-funded investigators to get their work published and to be seen. Professor Oma. The incentives uh, to publication uh, are s weakened uh, considerably by the 12-month uh, uh, publication requirement. Six months would effectively uh, destroy the, uh, the market for those journals, in my opinion. Uh, you know, one of the more compelling arguments for increased public access is, are, are these patient groups, and you, you touched on it at, at the end of, the, end of your testimony, Professor. How do you address that? What, what's the answer to that? How, how, how do you go back to these patient groups to say, look, we want to get this information as swiftly as possible. I don't care what your financial model is. We've got we to gotta save lives here. Maybe Dr. Breck, Breckler, we can start with you and then Mr. Adler. That's absolutely correct. And, and we have um, maintained all along that we would like to sit down with all of the stakeholders and work out a viable system for everybody, rather than having the federal government mandate one particular model that happens to be in favor at one particular And I guess that's the agency. issue. We, we, I mean, if, if there's something every, we could get everybody to agree on, I'd love to see that. It, but is there any, is there progress towards that? Is there any suggestion of that? Is there anything that's come close to that? Absolutely. The, the um, publishers are already, have always been at the leading edge of innovation in these kinds of things and are working with all kinds of groups to make available the relevant articles, um, to put them in repositories, to identify the ones ahead of time that are of greatest relevance, um, to do all kinds of things to increase the accessibility and availability of them. Mr. Adler. Uh, that's correct, uh, uh, Congressman, that uh, publishers have been working with patient advocacy organizations in the past few years, for example, uh, to create something called Patient Inform, which is an online service that provides patients and their caregivers access to some of the most up-to-date uh, reliable research about the diagnosis and treatment of specific diseases and does so at no cost to them. Uh, patient Inform also helps to interpret the research and provides access to additional, more easily comprehended materials that help explain diagnosis and treatment. Uh, at the same time, many publishers individually uh, have their own programs for providing access to patient, including walk-in clauses, as they're uh, called, in their licenses that enable libraries uh, that subscribe to uh, their journals to give any member of the public free electronic on-site access to those journal articles. Okay. Uh, thank you all. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you back. Thank you. I, I now recognize the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Chu, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dr. Oman, in your testimony, you wondered if the government will commandeer the rights of 
of creators of pre-existing materials that submitted articles may, may contain. I have three questions about that. First, um, how often do articles contain materials that the researcher does not already own? And secondly, do publishers always clear these rights for the author? And thirdly, why would publishers not continue to provide this service under an open access policy? I think they would continue to provide those services uh, if uh, they were still in business and uh, uh, could make a go of it uh, commercially. Uh, the danger is, of course, that they won't remain in business and they won't be available to, to make, provide those, those valuable services in polishing and, uh, and shaping and uh, uh, preparing the, uh, the article for uh, public dissemination. Uh, I uh, probably should defer to the, uh, uh, the publishers uh, on that point. Uh, but uh, it, it's my view that uh, uh, that the uh, the system uh, uh, that we uh, have now, uh, in terms of giving copyrights to the authors, uh, to the uh, the publishers, uh, is the best way of uh, encouraging the dissemination of this material and having those valuable services added on to the the raw manuscript that is produced by the uh, government-funded researcher. If I can respond also, yes. um, I'm not in the publishing end of um, APA, but I do know enough about how things work. Um, that's an example of the kind of value added to scientific publications to check those things and to give credit where credit is due. It takes time, it takes staff, it, it takes um, work to do that, it takes money to do that and to do it well. Um, and it, it's just another example of the many, many things that consume resources to bring to the market high quality scientific publications. That's the kind of thing, w APA wouldn't publish articles without checking those kinds of things and taking care of those kinds of things ever. Um, but we have to take into account the economic reality of what it costs to do that. Mm. Um, Dr. Breckler, in fact, um, I wanted to ask uh, about APA, you know, as a psychologist myself and former member of the American Psychological Association, I understand that our field is different from other scientific research disciplines. Can you explain how the NIH public access model uh, uni uniquely affects psychology compared to other disciplines? I, I know you've, uh, in your testimony, you talk about 15% uh, of lifetime use occurs in the first year. I, I wonder if that is unique to our discipline uh, or whether it's similar to other ones. Sure, a couple of comments. 